oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Parliament had a vote of non-confidence in David Johnston, the chalet buddy and ski buddy of the Prime Minister, member of the Trudeau Foundation, someone the Prime Minister appointed to investigate Beijing's interference. David Johnston said in answer to the vote that he doesn't work for Parliament, he works for the government, the Prime Minister. And that's exactly the problem, Mr. Speaker. Only 27% of Canadians trust him to do this work. Will the Prime Minister finally fire David Johnston and appoint an independent judge for an independent inquiry? For public safety. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I believe it's unfair and frankly offensive to question Mr. Johnson's allegiance. His 50-year career, his 50-year career in public service makes it clear that his loyalty is to Canada. And I believe that he represents the highest ideals of hard work, dedication, public service, and humility. And we should all be, for, be thankful that he perseveres in his commitment to service to Canada. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I'd like to thank the Minister of Emergency Public uh, Emergency Responsiveness for his briefing yesterday uh, with regards to the wildfires. Uh, I know that Pre Premier Houston and other provincial leaders have been working hard to protect public safety, to save lives, and minimize damage to property. Uh, would the uh, minister please rise and give us an update, since the government of Nova Scotia has asked for assistance, would he give an update on what assistance the federal government will provide? The Honourable for Emergency Preparedness. I thank the, the, the Leader of the Opposition for the question and also for attending that briefing. In, in an emergency when all Canadians' safety is threatened, it's all hands on deck and it's important that we work together. Mr. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Premier Houston has in fact uh, submitted a request for assistance. It was immediately approved. We have been mobilizing the resources Nova Scotia needs and in fact many of those resources have already been delivered. We will act as expeditiously as possible to make sure that Nova Scotians get the, the resources that they need and that we respond positively. We're very carefully and closely with Premier Houston. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are in shock today that the Beta Nor project is now being delayed by three years, wow. uh, maybe forever. The, uh, this government killed two pipelines, bungled and massively overspent on a third, killed the Tech Frontier Mine, block 14 or 15 massive natural gas liquefaction uh, projects that are n necessary to fight global climate change. Will this government remove its gatekeepers so that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians can bring home energy production to their province and our country? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Leader of the Opposition well knows that project, I approved myself that project just, just last year. And as the company has announced yesterday, they are putting the project on pause for three years because of market conditions. So that's their decision, that's the company's decisions, and we will take it as it is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm the Leader of the Opposition. Whenever this government henpecks to death a natural resource project, they force the company to claim it has something to do with market conditions. Uh, they do that by threatening them to do more damage on other projects. We know they did that with Trans Canada's uh, National Pipeline, uh, claiming that it was the daily price of oil right. <laughs> that had caused the company to cancel a project that would have been in place for uh, more than half a century. We know that the price of oil has been stable now. We know that the energy demand is going to be continuing for at least half a century. We know also this government kills projects like this. Why won't they get out of the way and let Newfoundlanders and Labradorians bring home paychecks for yeah. the The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, and, and again, I'd like to reiterate, this was an independent business decision made by Equinor. It's not a cancellation, and the decision was largely due to market forces. But let's also talk about the fact that right now we introduced legislation to diversify Newfoundland and Labrador's economy. We have introduced C49, and it provides huge opportunities for offshore projects, resource projects, and that's what we're doing. We are making sure that we are diversifying and supporting the economies right across our country. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The problem is they can't get out of the way to let people get things done. It's not just oil and gas. The Fisheries Department blocked a tidal wave 
power project in Nova Scotia so long that the private company that was going to build it up and left to build it somewhere else. By the government's own admission, it takes as long as 25 years to get a mine approved. No wonder we don't actually produce any lithium here in Canada. We have to import it from abroad. And yesterday, the Resources Minister tweeted out a bunch of projects that aren't even started. Why won't they get out of the way so Canadians can get things done? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We are getting good projects done, and I'd like to highlight that just earlier this year, we've approved two mines with the James Bay Lithium Marathon Palladium, two mines approved under this government. More than that, if we're looking at LNG projects, let's look at Cedar LNG. It's a First Nations owned business, and it is something that has been pointed out by that First Nation as being economic reconciliation in progress. We are supporting good energy projects in our country. Excellent. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the House voted for a public inquiry on Chinese interference. All three opposition parties were defending the public, which is asking for the inquiry, but there will still not be an inquiry. Why? Because, as David Johnston explained yesterday, his mandate comes neither from the House of Commons nor the public. His mandate comes from the Prime Minister himself. And the Prime Minister said no over my dead body. People will not get the inquiry. Mr. Speaker, I know Liberal members across the way. They believe in democracy. Aren't they embarrassed to see their leader standing alone against an inquiry and against the entire public? The Honourable Minister of Sports. Mr. Speaker, I must say that as a relatively new parliamentarian, I am very disappointed to see that some elected officials do not seem to understand the importance of protecting our intelligence services and the people who work to gather that intelligence. Protecting democracy and our institutions is something we're all responsible for. And the responsible thing for opposition party leaders to do would be to get their security clearance, receive the briefings, and work with us to strengthen our democracy. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, of foreign powers attacking our democracy. That is extremely important. A majority of people are asking for a public inquiry. People are concerned, and a majority of their elected representatives are asking for a public inquiry. One man, the prime minister, is fighting against what people want, want, what people want. The only person supporting him is David Johnston, who is not an elected official, and by his own admission only reports to the prime minister, not to elected representatives of the public. Mr. Speaker, if we want to defend our democracy, we need to respect it. When will the Prime Minister finally understand that? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, we should remember that by getting their security clearance, party leaders will be able to access the secret information that was used by Mr. David Johnston. So the responsible thing to do to not just debate about opinions but about facts would be to get the security clearance, receive the briefings, and then after that, work with the rest of the House to bring forward solutions to better protect our democracy and institutions, because foreign interference is something we should all care about here. A member for Burnaby South. Wildfires are raging across the country. We're seeing forest fires like we've never seen before so early in the season. Regions in the Atlantic are hard hit. The prairies are, hit, are hard hit. Northern communities, the West, these are forest fires like we've never be seen before this early. Communities are hard hit and impacted. What is this government going to do to deal with what might be a record-breaking year for forest fires and the damage that it might have on communities? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. I, th I thank, I thank the, the member for, the, for an important question. Mr. Speaker, we've seen a very significant a number of fires in this country, and in fact, 2.7 million uh, hectares of, of fire, forest have been lost to fires so far this, this season. We're working very closely with the provincial and territorial partners, and we're making significant investments. But let me also acknowledge that there is a great deal more work to do. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. On fait face. Mr. Speaker, we are facing an opioid crisis that has killed a record number of people throughout the country. I have met with Mothers who have lost a child to that crisis, they are asking to meet the leader of the Conservative Party, but he rejected that offer. That shows a real lack of respect. When will this government take action to save lives? 
the Honorable Minister of Mental Health for Mental Health. It is shameful that the leader of the opposition is determined to hang on to a discredited, illogical and outdated drug policy. His fear campaign will increase bias and cost lives. Safe consumption sites that he wants to close have enabled us to prevent have enabled us to prevent over 46,000 overdoses since 2017. We cannot allow the Conservatives to bring us back to the failed ideology of the past. Oh. Mr. Speaker, in response to yesterday's vote, where members of Parliament representing a clear majority of Canadian voters demanded that he step down, phony rapporteur David Johnson said he isn't going anywhere. In fact, he said that... I, I'm just going to, like, there's some words that kind of the meaning are just not really parliamentary. So I'm going to ask the member to just keep going, but remember that, okay? Very good. Please, from the top, from the top with nice language, please. Mr. Speaker, in response to yesterday's vote where MPs representing a clear majority of Canadians voted for him to step aside, Rapporteur David Johnson said he isn't going anywhere. In fact, he said he doesn't work for Parliament or Canadians. He said he works for the government. That's the problem, Mr. Speaker. He works for the same Liberal government that benefited from Beijing's election interference. And he personally serves the Prime Minister who chose to do nothing while Chinese Canadians were bullied into voting for his Liberal Party. Right. Nobody is fooled by this sham of a process. So when will the Prime Minister fire his ski buddy and call a public inquiry? The Honourable Member for, or Minister for Emergency Preparedness. I'm reminded once again that it's not only unfair but deeply offensive. To, to, to listen to the member opposite question Mr. Johnson's allegiance to this country. His 15-year career in public service has made it crystal clear to everyone that his loyalty is to Canada. And Mr. Speaker, as I also said, and as I quote former Prime Minister Harper, Mr. Johnson represents hard work, dedication, public service, and humility. Mr. Speaker, Canada is blessed to have a man so dedicated to public service, persevering through this type of abuse. Member for Regina Capel. Canada is cursed by a Prime Minister who tarnished that man's reputation by involving him in the scandal. The Prime Minister can't be the one to decide how to investigate this scandal because he benefited from it. And David Johnson can't decide either because he's a family friend and a longtime member of the Trudeau Foundation. And Frank Iacobucci can't be the one to sign off on David Johnson's role because he's part of the Trudeau Foundation as well. Conflict of interest, conflict of interest, conflict of interest. Why is it that whenever the best interests of Canadians conflict with the political interests of the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister always chooses himself. Yeah. The Honourable Member, Minister for uh, Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, protecting Canada from the nefarious, hostile activities of foreign state actors is a priority for our government. We've taken very significant action to protect the Canadian, of Canadian institutions and, in particular, our democracy. We recognize that there is more work. Can we interrupt for a second? Please, quiet! Quiet! Okay, you heard me this time. What I'm going to ask is everyone to respect each other so that one side doesn't see the other one screaming or the other side doesn't see the other side is screaming. It does go both ways and that's the way we're going to enforce it. The Honourable Minister, from the top, please, and hopefully we have some peace and quiet and some respect in this chamber. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, protecting Canada from nefarious hostile activities of foreign state actors like China is a priority for our government. We have taken significant action to protect the integrity of Canadian institutions and in particular our democracy. We recognize that there is more work to do and we all have a responsibility to stand up and protect our democracy. I would invite all members to cease their attacks on some of the finest Canadians I know and to unite in this important work. The Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Speaker, yesterday after this House voted non-confidence in the so-called special rapporteur, the rapporteur issued a statement in which he stated that he doesn't answer to this House. Instead, he answers to the Prime Minister. So now that the Prime Minister's so-called rapporteur has finally admitted that he's not independent, will he end the charade fire him, and call an independent public inquiry. Yeah. 
the Honorable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, as I've already explained, Mr. Johnson's 50-year career in public service, culminating in, in his, his role as the Governor General of this country, has made it crystal clear to all Canadians that his loyalty is to Canada. Well, I think everyone asked me to stop people from heckling and st shouting in front of it, and I'm still hearing voices coming. I'll do it from each side, so you don't want me interrupting you over and over again. And we might have to change the way we do things in here as far as the list goes. So I'm going to ask the Honourable Minister to start again. I expect quiet, the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I've already made clear, Mr. Johnson's 50-year career of public service, culminating in his role as the Governor General of Canada, has made it crystal clear to all Canadians, and certainly to this House, that his loyalty is to this country, to this nation, to Canada. Mr. Speaker, his ideals of hard work and dedication, and his commitment to persevere through some of the, frankly, offensive criticism that's being put his way, I think is, is something for all, which all Canadians should be grateful. We are very fortunate to have a man of his experience and, and values to lead this work on behalf of the nation. The Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, his loyalty should be to the people of Canada and the elected members of this place and not to the Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah. Today, this House voted non confidence and Canadians have no confidence in the so-called Special Rapporteur because in, he's in a conflict. He's a lifelong friend of the Prime Minister. He's a former member of the Beijing-financed Trudeau Foundation. And yesterday, he admitted he doesn't work for Canadians. He works for the Prime Minister. Why won't the Prime Minister acknowledge this blatant conflict of interest and fire his fake rapporteur? Woo! The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, the only thing fake in this place is the Conservative outrage. All Canadians yep. expect opposition parties to work hard to criticize government, but what Canadians also expect is that they do so with information and that they are informed by the Conservatives refusing to receive the confidential information that was the basis of the Right Honourable David Johnson's report. They. What they do, Mr. Speaker, is they live under a veil of ignorance, but Canadians oh. expect on issues of national security that there are reasonable, responsible members in this House serving their... With the interference that I'm still hearing, I'm going to try a different thing. Maybe the end of the list is less noisy. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Speaker, today marks 1,241 days since the IRGC murdered 55 Canadian citizens and 30 permanent residents, among 176 people killed when flight PS752 was shot down. One of them was my friend. Last year, on the thousandth day, Iranian Canadians came to Ottawa to get justice for those innocent victims and get action on Iranian operatives who threaten and intimidate Iranian Canadians on our own soil. They also wanted their government to finally designate the IRGC as terrorists. Mr. Speaker, all they got were useless platitudes. On June 11th, they return to Parliament Hill. Will they again receive The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the Iranian regime bears full responsibility for the tragic downing of Flight PS752. We are focused on the next steps and we will continue to pursue all available means for holding the Iranian regime accountable. Action is underway under the Montreal Convention seeking binding arbitration. If an arbitral tribunal cannot be organized within six months, we will then be able to move on to litigation before the International Court of Justice. Mr. Speaker, we will not rest until the families get the justice, transparency and accountability from Iran that they so truly deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Communities in Nunavut must rely on safe, affordable and accessible air transportation. This government's New Deal with Canadian North jeopardizes the overall well-being of Nunavut. Raising prices would increase the cost of food and supplies and threaten the already limited health care that people in Nunavut rely on. Will this government commit to keeping air travel affordable so Northerners can access the services and care they need? The Honourable Minister of Transport. 
Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for her question. Our government understands the importance of air transportation, accessible, affordable air transportation to many regions of Canada, including the north. We have been working diligently, Mr. Speaker, with the airline, with, uh, with uh, the territories to ensure that the airline is able to maintain viable, efficient transportation so people who live in the north are able to access that critical service. Thank you very much. We'll try going back to the list again. L'honorable député de Mégantique-Lérable. The honorable member for Mégantique-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, what is it that the Prime Minister wants to hide so much that he's endangering Canada's democracy? He's determined to keep his special rapporteur, dear family friend, member of the Trudeau Foundation. Why? Because he's satisfied with his work. In fact, David Johnson did exactly what the Prime Minister expected. He implemented the PM's plan and protected him from a public inquiry. Will the Prime Minister finally admit that he knew in advance when he said that he would follow the recommendations of his special friend and special rapporteur that he would not be recommending a public inquiry? Mr. Speaker, while foreign state actors try to undermine our democracy, what do you see from the Conservatives? Nothing more than political attacks. Every single member of this House, every Canadian should take the issue of foreign interference seriously. But what the Conservatives do is they don't offer solutions, they don't offer recommendations. All they do is take cheap political and personal shots. And Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect more maturity from the official opposition but we are going to work hard to ensure our democratic institutions are protected for all Canadians because it's not a partisan issue. Here, 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 here. It's getting noisy again. I'm going to try the back end of the list again. The Honourable Member for Bonavista Buren Trinity. Mr. Speaker, our veterans represent the very best of us. The women and men who served our country have done so with immense bravery and selflessness and they deserve the best care and support possible. There are so many unique organizations across Canada that are going above and beyond to help support our veterans and their families. They're integral to veterans, but also important pillars in our communities. Could the Minister of Veterans Affairs please share with this House what's being done to support these organizations? Honourable Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for this important question. Last week, I was in the Old Mission Brewery in Montreal to announce over $6 million in funding to 21 organizations right across the country that are doing vitally important work to support our veterans and their families. These projects will help veterans in a wide variety of ways, including addressing homelessness, homelessness retraining employment, uh, mental health and supporting underrepresented veterans. We will continue to work hard to ensure Canada's veterans have the care and support they need and deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Le député de Beauce. The Honourable Member for Beauce. On va aller, uh, the Honourable... I'm sorry, but that's not the way my list is working. There's a rule that says the speaker, the speaker decides who's going to speak next. So I'm going to ask him to sit down. So if the member for both wants to get up, he can get up. Otherwise, I'll go to the next name on my list. I'm glad the honorable member for both got permission. The honorable member for both. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is World Milk Day, and I would like to rise to speak to the hard work of all dairy producers and processors from sea to sea. They work so hard, but with the second carbon tax that is being brought in by this government, the entire agricultural sector is threatened. Canadians need farmers to put food on the table. When will the Liberals finally wake up and cancel the second carbon tax so that Canadians can feed their families? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Well, I'd like to wish everyone a happy World Milk Day. And I'd like to thank my colleague for giving me the opportunity to sincerely thank all of our dairy producers throughout the country. They are working very hard to ensure that we have sustainable agriculture. And did you know that our milk producers are committed to a sector that is zero emissions, I'd like to congratulate them for this plan. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mégantique-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, 
The special rapporteur admitted it himself yesterday. He received his mandate from the prime minister, and he doesn't care at all about the vote in the House of Commons. According to the Journal de Montréal, it is clear that Mr. Johnston has become Justin Trudeau's advisor. His understanding of his role is to protect his boss, the prime minister, even if it means sacrificing his career and his reputation. That's according to Yasmin Abdel Fadel today in the Journal de Montréal. The name of the column is... David Johnston is the new enemy of democracy. That's not something the Conservatives are saying, Mr. Speaker. When will the Prime Minister finally put an end to the former Governor General's sufferings? When will he put an end to this farce and trigger a public inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague explained earlier, David Johnston has had an exemplary career. He has always been devoted to serving Canadians, and he still is. I would like to remind my colleagues whether Conservatives are in the Bloc Québécois. I'd like to remind them that we should respect and protect Canadian intelligence services. We should respect and protect all those who are working to gather that intelligence. I would ask the leaders of the parties to get their clearance, receive the briefings, and that we stop talking about mere opinion and instead get the facts and have constructive discussions about our democracy and institutions. Thank you. The Honourable Deputy de Trois-Rivières. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since February, the opposition parties have been asking for a public inquiry on Chinese interference, but the Prime Minister refused to do so. And instead, he appointed a special rapporteur, despite everyone else's opinion. And three months later, we're still in the same impasse. David Johnston finally tabled his report. He blames everyone, the media, CSIS, the opposition, everyone except for China and this government. That's why yesterday, the House once again asked for a public inquiry, because people's desire for public inquiry is not being respected. When will this government finally start a public independent inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker. Opposition party leaders would have access to all of the intelligence that would enable, that did enable David Johnson to draft his report and to make the recommendations that we have now. The right thing to do would be to get their security clearance, read the report, and then come back after to be able to discuss constructive solutions to protect our institutions and our democracy. Foreign interference is a threat to our country. It should be taken seriously, above and beyond partisan fear-mongering. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd hope for a better answer. Let's come back to what we learned yesterday about the member for Dur Durham. CIS has told him that he was the target of a Chinese disinformation campaign during the 2021 election. And let's not forget that he was the leader of the opposition at that time, someone who could have legitimate aspirations to become prime minister. He was the leader of a party that did, after all, receive the most votes in 2021. So we're not just talking about just anyone. It's not just the government that is the target of interference. This affects all of our democracy. We are all affected. We're all asking for a public inquiry. What is the government waiting for? Mr. Speaker, I'm really happy to see the bloc so interested in this issue. But what would Mr. Johnson's report actually said was that he included an annex with all of the information that he reviewed, the confidential information that he reviewed, and he provided it to party leaders and asked them to review, to receive their security clearance, to review it, and determine if his, um, his recommendations from it were appropriate. But, Mr. Speaker, what has the leader of the bloc chosen to do? Close his eyes under a veil of ignorance and ignore the actual Actual facts of the matter. Mr. Speaker, an NDP member, a Conservative member, and the former leader of the official opposition, they have all been targeted by these threats, and I'm sure there are many others. And yet the Prime Minister tells us that is that is the opposition that's creating a toxic climate here? Really? The toxic climate is caused by the fact that our election system has been threatened, and the government only wants to discuss that behind closed doors and take no action. The time has come for transparency. The time has come to cast light on the situation. The time has come for a public and independent inquiry. When will they finally understand? The Honourable Minister of Sports. Mr. Speaker, what the time has come for is for opposition party leaders to, to put aside partisanship Go receive the briefing 
as they have a right to do, and then we can move on, discuss facts, and discuss solutions. Because the matter of foreign interference, everyone agrees on this, it's a threat to our country, it must be taken seriously, and it must be done right. We need to protect our intelligence services. We need to protect public servants who are gathering that intelligence. They need to do the right thing. Go get the briefing. I would like to mention that I do not see the name of the member for Paul Neuf, Jacques Cartier, on this list, but he wants to ask questions anyway. You'd better go talk about it with your whip. For Chatham Kent Leamington. Mr. Speaker, this government's policies are akin to death by a thousand taxes as Canadian wa Canadians watch their life savings bleed away. Gas prices are draining their uh, bank accounts, and as Liberal carbon tax one adds 41 cents per litre, Liberal tax carbon tax two adds another 17 cents per litre. But don't forget, Mr. Speaker, just like adding salt to this open wound, the government's GST is a tax on a tax on a tax. This combination will add a whopping 61 cents per price of litre for gas for Canadians. I ask again, when will the minister get the facts and stop the tax? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we gotta, we gotta roll the tape back, Mr. Speaker, because not once, not twice, not three times, but five times just in the last year, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives have had the opportunity to reduce taxes on Canadians. And what do they do, Mr. Speaker? Every single time we vote to reduce taxes on Canadians, how do they vote? Against. When we reduce taxes on workers, how do they vote against? How do they vote? Against. When we reduce taxes on the middle class, how do they vote? Against. When we reduce taxes on people who just want to pay their bills, how do the Conservatives vote? Against. You know the plan, we do, we're going to keep delivering for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Mr. Speaker, mothers in the North are having to make very difficult decisions because of this Prime Minister's first carbon tax. And now it's even worse with their new carbon tax 2.0. From Northwest Territories MLA Jackie Jacobson, we're really hurting. Single mothers are having to choose to buy Pampers or pay their cell bill or pay their power bill or pay to buy food, and people are going without. No mother should ever have to make the difficult decision between buying food or keeping their children exactly. warm in winter. Exactly. When will this Prime Minister finally end and axe his cruel carbon tax? Excellent. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, we know the rising cost of food and groceries is having a challenging impact on families and single moms, and that's why we introduced programs like the $10 a day child care, the Canada Worker Benefit, dental care, and the Canada Child Benefit to help make more life more affordable for families, for moms, and all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Canadian families are all suffering financially, but this government is continuing to be greedy, not to help people, but just to take more money out of their pockets with this new taxes. Not once, not twice, not thrice, four times. First of all, the Liberal carbon tax. That was the first thing. Then they put a tax on that tax. Now they have a second Liberal carbon tax, and they want to tax that, so that makes four in total. Ridiculous. When will this government understand that four taxes on Canadian families who are struggling, that's a terrible idea? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I must admit that it's very disappointing to hear my honourable colleague across the way make these kinds of shortcuts, because he knows very well that in Quebec, the carbon pricing system does not apply. And speaking of carbon pricing, Mr. Speaker, in 2021, all members of the Conservative Party campaigned for carbon pricing. Not only that, 19 members on the other side campaigned for that in 2019 and in 2008. And yet, twice over, they're breaking their promises to Canadians. That's not what we do on this side of the House. We work for Canadians, and we are fighting climate change. A member for Vancouver, Kingsway. The Minister of Health recently blocked reforms that would save Canadians billions on their prescription medicines. The Minister said he did this because he wanted to be consulted by Canada's drug price regulator, but didn't receive an invitation. In fact, documents obtained by the Health Committee show he was invited at least five times. Wow. And the minister's office either ignored or rejected them. Why won't the minister come clean with Canadians and just admit it? He refused to lower drug prices because Big Pharma told him not to. The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm grateful to the question. As the member knows really well, I think uh, we had discussions on that just a few months ago. That is, on July the 1st, we put into place some of the strongest regulations ever put into place to regulate the prices of patented medicine. This is great news because we're now going to compare the cost of patented drugs in Canada to a new basket of countries, which is a better basket of countries, excluding the highest cost seen in the world, which is in the United States and Switzerland, and we look forward to doing more. Member for Vancouver East. 200 residents of a West End Toronto building are taking action against huge rent increases by their landlord. Their rent is being jacked up by 40% this fall. Seniors on fixed income, workers and families are worried sick that they could end up on the street. Under the Liberals, rents have skyrocketed. We're now seeing rents double or even triple in communities. This is unacceptable. Will the Liberals stop these rental evictions put people before profits and launch an acquisition fund for nonprofits to keep rents low. The Honourable Minister for Housing. The Honourable Member knows that uh, rent uh, subsidies and making sure that rental rates reflect fairness is really in the provincial uh, jurisdiction. However, we do believe that we have a role to help vulnerable renters. That's why we introduced the Canada Housing Benefit, which is helping tens of thousands of Canadian households across each province and territory in Canada. That's why we also introduced a top-up to the Canada Housing Benefit. It is why we're also making sure we're building more rental supply, including uh, more supply of affordable rental units across the country, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Scarborough Agent Court. This year marks the centennial of the Chinese Exclusion Act, a shameful chapter in our nation's history that we must not forget. Can the Minister of International Trade tell this House how our government is planning to commemorate the history of the Chinese Exclusion Act and what steps it is taking to continue supporting Chinese Canadians and their heritage? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, a hundred years ago, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in this Parliament that stop Chinese immigrants from coming to Canada, stop families from reuniting, and cause racism and harm. These same Chinese immigrants help build Canada's railway to connect our country from coast to coast to coast. I pay tribute to those whose strong advocacy repealed that law, but it took 24 years. Our government is recognizing the centennial as an event of national historic significance, and we're commemorating it with a plaque. We must ensure that this never happens again. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' first carbon tax hikes the cost of gas and diesel, doubles heating, and makes groceries more expensive. So a record 1.5 million Canadians had to go to a food bank in one month, and one in five Canadians skip meals just to get by. But the Liberals will hit struggling Canadians with carbon tax too anyway. It'll add 17 cents a litre at the pumps, and it'll hurt the working poor and people on low incomes the most. Why don't the Liberals care and why won't they axe their costly carbon taxes? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So setting aside for a second the fact that the members opposite all campaign to put in price carbon pricing in Canada, let's look at what they're saying no to. So they're saying no to clean air and clean water, Mr. Speaker. While we're evacuating people in New Brunswick, in Quebec, we have to airlift people outside of Fort Chippewan last night, Mr. Speaker, because of climate change. They're saying, let's make pollution free again. Let's move away from the economy of the 21st century. Mr. Speaker, we're saying no. We have the strongest economy of all G7 countries last year, and we have the con we're the country that has reduced its emission the most of all G7 countries. We can fight climate change and have a strong economy. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. The Liberals say that carbon tax are supposed to reduce emissions, but after eight years they've missed every target, and they only went down slightly once when governments locked Canada down. To really help lower global emissions, Canada could export LNG, but after eight years and 18 proposals, the only one getting built was approved by Conservatives before, from oil and gas to critical minerals to tidal power and to offshore opportunities on every coast. The Liberals hold Canada back. The world wants Canada's energy and technology. These Liberals are out of touch and Canadians are out of money. So when will they axe their harmful, failed, costly carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but the, may, the, the member is plainly wrong. We haven't missed our target. They missed our target. I was in Copenhagen in 2009 when Prime Minister Harper committed Canada to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. They did nothing, Mr. Speaker. We've reduced emissions by 50 million tonnes between 2019 and 2021, the best performance of all G7 countries. We did that while creating millions of jobs in this country, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and having the strongest economy of G7 countries. Yeah. Honourable member for Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Eight long years out of control spending, and what are we seeing, Mr. Speaker? More Canadians using food banks, going hungry, and worried about how they're going to make ends meet. Carbon tax number one increases a litre of gas by 41 cents and makes everything more expensive. Carbon tax two adds another 17 cents and more pain for Canadians. Add the GST and the price is 61 cents wow. a litre. Wow. Why is this Prime Minister so intent on pricing Canadians out of a living? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, I quote from the 2021 Conservative Party platform, our plan will ensure that all Canadians can do their part to fight climate change in a way that works best for them and at a carbon price that is affordable, increasing to $50 a tonne. And the document further states we will assess progress so carbon prices can be on a path to $170 a tonne. Mr. Speaker, either they believe that climate change is real or they they don't, but there's one thing that's for certain. The Canadians in this country can't believe a word that that side says. I'm going to ask the honourable members, before going to the next question, again, if they want to have conversations across the aisle, just cross the aisle and talk to each other. Don't talk across to each other, please. Now, the honourable member for Tobik Mactaquak. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax has been in place in some jurisdictions in Canada now for nearly 15 years. The Commissioner of the Environment admitted at committee recently that Canada has no metric by which to measure if there's been any reduction in carbon as a result of its implementation. Right. With no results other than its diminishing effects on Canadian pocketbooks, why in the world would this government place an additional carbon tax on their already weary and burdened backs? When will this government finally listen to the common sense of the common people and scrap this useless aggressive, ineffective, and punitive tax. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Commissioner to the Environment did not have the benefit of our latest National Inventory Report, which shows that we have the best performance of all G... Wait a minute. Wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Both sides are talking to each other. You're like, it's like we're not, we're not at a party here. We're in the House of Commons. So I want everybody to just calm down and listen. The Honourable Minister, if you can start from the top so we can all hear your answer, please. With pleasure, sir. As I was saying, when he went to committee, the Commissioner to the Environment did not benefit from the, the information in our latest National Inventory Report, which shows that we've reduced emissions by 50, 53 million tonnes, Mr. Speaker. That's the equivalent of removing 11 million vehicles from our road between 2019 and 2021 while we're landing deals like Volkswagen, like we're landing deals with Tidewater in BC, Imperial $720 million plant in Alberta for biorefinery, Federated Co-op $2 billion plant in Saskatchewan, or Brya's plant in Newfoundland, which have received in the, in the last few months $300 million. The Honourable Member for jean Pierre, Mr. Speaker. The Quebec National Assembly on Thursday unanimously demanded the release of the Grenier Commission documents. Uh, this commission revealed that the federal government incurred illegal expenses during the 1995 referendum. Now the National Assembly will be missing crucial documents, those from the federal government. Ottawa has already refused to open its archives. The Minister of Heritage was asked to cooperate on Tuesday, but instead he accused the four parties in Quebec City of living in the past. Let's give him a second chance, Mr. Speaker to be more constructive with the 125 elected members of the National Assembly? Will he open his archives to them? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, I was talking directly to my friends from the Bloc who are constantly seeking uh, quarrels. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about quarrels. It reminds me of the famous... They have a lot of issues. There are some words we can't say here in the House. That's not a parliamentary term you're using. 
I'd like the minister to continue without using terms that are sacrilegious. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. I remove uh, the words that I mentioned from that song, but the bloc is always searching for subjects to divide us. How come they don't work with the government to make a difference for our families and seniors and young people, for our companies? That would be there a good idea. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. There's such a lack of respect, Mr. Speaker. What a lack of respect to the Quebec National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, throughout history, like uh, when you're in a marriage, the one who gets angry and accuses of, uh, of reopening quarrels is often the one at fault. And that's exactly what's happening with the federal government that's being accused of illegal financing. Mr. Speaker, the National Assembly is unanimous. It voted to investigate this illegal financing last Thursday. We're not living in the past if we want to go back to last Thursday. So will the minister respect the will of the unanimous National Assembly and open the archives? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what time, uh, what type of uh, relationship my colleague has had in the past, but what concerns us? Well, I have a great deal of respect for the National Assembly in Quebec. What happens there? Well, I respect that jurisdiction. Uh, there is a debate in Quebec. We do discuss things, and I respect that. But the Bloc tries to bring quarrels and debates here that are 30 years old. How come they don't focus on what we can do together now to help society and Quebec to move forward? That would be productive, rather than always looking back. For Kildonan St. Paul. New stats out in Winnipeg show a very disturbing trend, Mr. Speaker. After eight years of this Liberal government, crime in Winnipeg is up over 25 percent over last year, wow. which includes a record 50 three homicides. And the Liberals have done absolutely nothing effective to address this. In fact, they've made it worse with their dangerous and reckless catch-and-release bail policies. Winnipegers deserve far better than this, Mr. Speaker. When will the Liberals reverse the damage they caused, clean up our streets, and finally protect our communities? Absolutely. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, we've been working uh, with pro provincial premiers, with provincial ministers of justice and, and provincial ministers of public safety and police associations across Canada to address questions about bail reform. We have done that, Mr. Speaker. We've tabled Bill C-48, which has the support of, of provinces, Mr. Speaker, which has the support of police associations across Canada. Here's what Saskatoon's police uh, service deputy chief said. It's encouraging to see the voices of the community and policing community across Canada being heard, Mr. Speaker. He called it a good move forward. Mr. Speaker, it's by working together that we can address complex problems like bail. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that bill will do very little to fix the problem that Liberal Minister and his Liberal government created. That's Meanwhile, right. innocent Canadians are being murdered, abused and violated on a daily basis in our communities. Conservatives know it doesn't have to be this way. And certainly Winnipeggers deserve far better than that what that Liberal minister is offering them. Last year, Winnipeg saw a 12 percent increase in knife attacks. Bear spray attacks doubled in the last three years. And property crime is way up, Mr. Speaker. And we know violent repeat offenders are behind most of these crimes. When will the Liberals, when will that minister reverse his dangerous catch and release policies once and for all, Mr. Speaker? When? When? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, there is no such catch and release policy. In fact, what we've done in Bill C-48 is address uh, repeat violent offenders, including with knives, Mr. Speaker, including with bear spray, Mr. Speaker. Manitoba, the government of Manitoba, as well as Indigenous peoples, asked for that provision. We provided that, Mr. Speaker, working with provinces and territories. Mr. Speaker, we need to work together. The provinces have the administration of uh, the justice system as part of their portfolio, uh, their, their jurisdiction. We need to work with the provinces, Mr. Speaker, not use, uh, not use meaningless rhetoric to try to, to, try to uh, debase the problem. Member, the Honourable Member for Charlebourg on Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, now that Roxham Road is closed, the hotels booked by the government are empty. We said for six years that it was impossible to find a solution for the legal entry into Roxham Road, but now we see it's possible today. And now the government has signed another $40 million contract with these hotels to reserve rooms. How come they're reserving hotels that are empty while they've, even though they've solved the Roxham Road issue? 
The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary, sorry. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate my colleague's question because it allows me to once again underscore the idea that on this side of the House, well, no, what they're trying to do is almost nothing. We have worked very hard to renegotiate the agreement between the U.S. and Canada. We have always been here for people who are asking for assistance. And, Mr. Speaker, we've already seen results that are concrete with asylum seekers and will always be there for the well-being of everyone who is asking for assistance from Canada. The Honourable Member for Lac saint louis Mr. Speaker, water is Canada's most precious natural resource for our economy and well-being. 20% of the world's freshwater reserves are in Canada, and it is also an, an enormous responsibility for us. Last week, the Prime Minister and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment were in Winnipeg to mark an important investment to protect Canada's water. Can the Minister of the Environment tell us more about this important step towards protecting 30% of Canada's water by 2030? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my Honourable Colleague for his question and for all his work on the Environment Committee. In the last budget, we did invest more than 750 rather, million in protect protecting fresh water across the country, which will allow us to establish an independent water agency in Winnipeg to protect the health of Canadians. It's protecting our economy and the future of our country. We've done quite a great deal. We still have more to do. Thank you. Central Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, I'm disgusted. The people of Newfoundland and Labrador are disgusted. After four years of Liberal delays, the Beta Noor project was approved with 137 onerous conditions attached. Because of these Liberal shenanigans, now we have the Beta Nord project put on the shelf for three years. Wow. It's costing the Newfoundland and Labrador uh, economy $3 billion in royalties and revenues. So my question to the Minister, will he revisit the 137 onerous conditions, or will he let this project die and let the province of Newfoundland and Labrador lose The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. This was an independent business decision that was based largely on market forces. But let's talk about the fact that Newfoundland and Labrador's opportunities go well beyond one project, and that's where we are with them to support them. In fact, we have just this past week tabled a bill with the Accords Act to make sure that they are able to take, uh, take advantage of offshore opportunities, including with wind and with hydrogen. And in fact, the member opposite would know when the German Chancellor came to Newfoundland and Labrador, what he asked for was hydrogen, and we signed an accord for that. Good job. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. The Liberals label the carbon tax a market mechanism or a standard, when in reality it is a fancy way of saying that the centerpiece of their environmental policy is based on forcing Canadians to pay more. Albertans are going to pay nearly $4,000 more per year when both carbon tax 1 and 2 are imposed, and farmers will pay more than $150,000 on average to fund this failed leftist ideological experiment. Wow. Canadians need a break. Farmers need a break. When will the Prime Minister finally listen? to Canadians and axe the tax. The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would remind my honourable colleague that he campaigned during the last election, the last election on putting in place carbon pricing, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, sir. What, what he's saying no to is saying no to billions of dollars of investment already happening in Canada, in Newfoundland, in Saskatchewan, in Quebec, in Alberta, in, the new, in, in southern Ontario, in the new economy. That's what they're saying no to, Mr. Speaker. We're saying yes to fighting climate change. We're saying yes to having a strong economy. It being 3.13, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for the discussion period today. Thank you for reminding me of that. It being 313, pursuant to order made on Thursday.